Well, good evening. It's always a privilege to be with you. That was kind of a week. Good evening. Good evening. evening. That's a little better. A little better. Well, welcome. So good to be with you as it always is to open God's Word together. We are continuing our series on Sunday nights. We, on, uh, we're, called, we, we're calling it Reclaiming Love, People of Compassion in a World of Hate. We've had some few breaks. We were Memorial Day. We had Mother's Day. We had kids' concert. All good things. Uh, but we're picking back up to continue the series. And so we're focusing on Sunday nights throughout this whole year of 2023 on this issue of reclaiming love, people of compassion in a world full of hate. And my goodness, isn't there just, there's just a lot of hate in the world. And um, kind of in the same, same vein that Scott just shared. You know, it's funny, I was thinking about the sermon, obviously, coming here tonight, and I'm driving, and I'm trying to get here, and this car in front of me, I don't know what they were doing, they weren't paying attention to the road, and they were being really slow, and there was only, and the light stopped, and then we waited, and then it changed, and they weren't moving, and I was trying to go, and I almost missed this light because this car was distracted doing whatever. And I found myself starting to get angry. And I'm like, oh my goodness, the hateful people aren't just out there. <laughs> They're in here too. And so I actually right then, like, Lord, forgive me for that. Uh, help me, because, you know, the hate is uh, something that we all have bound up in our heart sinfully, and it's love that conquers that, and it's the love of Christ. So we all have opportunity to reclaim love and reclaim love in terms of not just the world, but ourselves as well. So that's what we're focusing on. That story was for free, that was a bonus. But, but uh, tonight, we're gonna continue this series by addressing the topic of caring for one another with spiritual gifts. Caring for one another with spiritual gifts. And the, we're gonna look at a lot of text, but go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. I'm just going to read a few verses here before I ask for the Lord's help in prayer. We're going to look at several different passages, about four key passages in the New Testament that talk about spiritual gifts. We're going to look at most of them, not in a lot of detail, but just to get our bearings to address the subject tonight. But I want to begin my reading this, uh, these verses from 1 Corinthians 12. So here, in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, He addresses a lot of topics. When he gets to chapter 12, he spends the next three chapters, three chapters out of a 16-chapter book on just spiritual gifts. And yet, it's probably something we don't talk about a lot. So I'm hoping tonight will help with that. So let me just read these verses. I'm going to read the first 12 verses of 1 Corinthians 12. This is the word of the Lord. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed, You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who are portions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Let's pray. Father, even as we're talking tonight about God the Holy Spirit, It's particularly the gifts of grace that he gives to the body of Christ. We pray, Father, like the Apostle Paul prays in Ephesians 1, that you would grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. We pray, Father, for the Spirit's help in understanding your word better and knowing how to apply it better. Let us speak accurately about who you are and what you want us to do. And I pray, God, that we would leave here tonight better understanding your word 
and more in love with Christ and wanting to honor him and walking in obedience in our church. I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I was in uh, high school, I went to a, a large public high school. It was a magnet school, so it wasn't really close to my house. I had to take public transportation for a long time to get there, so I didn't really know anyone. And I had uh, recently been baptized the year before uh, that year, my eighth grade year before I went to high school. And so I was eager to want to be a Christian witness and meet other Christians in what was a pretty secular high school. And so I um, found out there was a Christian club on campus. They had some flyers and I, I went to their meeting and I wanted to, I was eager to meet some other Christians. And before this, I had mostly just met other Christians that were like from my church or pretty similar churches. So I went here and I was excited to meet these other believers. Well, I soon found out and talking with them, not only were they very different than me kind of culturally, a lot of them were, you know, were first generation um, Americans or something like that. It was a magnet school in inner city Philadelphia. But I also found out that a lot of them were Pentecostals or charismatics. I figured that out because we were having prayer time and they started praying and all I knew is I didn't understand what they were saying, but it wasn't because of the vocabulary, it was a different language. I'm like, oh my goodness. And then of course that first month of school, we had a see you at the poll rally. Anyone remember those? I don't even know if they still do those anymore. It was, it was kind of a big thing when, uh, you know, in the late, this was, this was in the mid to late 90s, where basically, you know, they try to gather everybody uh, in public schools across the whole country, the one day, they pick a day where everyone goes, all the Christians go to the flagpole, and they, they pray and ask to be a witness to the school. And um, so I went to this, and uh, there's maybe 15 or 20 of us there, and we were holding hands, praying on the flagpole, and you know, one girl, sweet girl, she, one of my classmates, I suppose, she came by and she started prophesying to everybody. And she gave me some prophecy, and I didn't understand what was happening. Some other person was getting hit in the head and getting slain in the spirit and falling on the ground. I was like, wow, this is interesting. <laughs> this is not what I was used to. And so I, um, I was trying to sort this out. I was a relatively young believer, and I was talking to another friend of mine who used to go to my church, went to another church, and he told me, oh, my pastor gave me this book, and he gave me a copy of it. And so I took it. I didn't really get a chance to read it, but I threw it in my backpack and brought it to school one day, thinking maybe I'll get some chance to, to read it on the bus or something like that. And... Um, the, uh, the title of the book was uh, A Cure for Charismatics. And so I had it in my backpack, and so I'm sitting there in homeroom, and one of my Christian friends, who was part of the Christian club and was a charismatic, one day she asked me for something in homeroom, and I said, oh, I think it was like a pencil or a calculator or whatever, and I said, oh, it's just in my bag, go grab it out of my bag. Well, she goes in my bag to pull out the school item, and she sees this book. And I just hear her yell out across the room, what are we, some kind of disease? Oh, yeah, that was <laughs> not the best way to broach the topic. Needless to say, I mention that story not just because it's a personal anecdote for me, but because it illustrates that when we're talking about spiritual gifts, so often it just becomes a point of tension. It becomes a point of division in the church those who believe in the spiritual gifts and those who don't, or at least some of the gifts or don't. And then people just wanna fight about that, especially some of the gifts that I was just describing. And I, honestly, I really hate that it's a point of division and tension, uh, or in some cases that it's sometimes it, uh, talking about spiritual gifts can be a source of jealousy. Oh, I, I, I wish I had that gift. They have such a cool gift, and I have a lame gift. I want their gift. I, I wish I, I could sing as well as, as Pastor Scott, or I wish I could play an instrument as well as Edison Dickinson, or I wish I could work a puppet as well as Trevor Komatsu does, you know? But yeah, what, whatever the spiritual gift is, you wish you had that gift, and you're, and you're jealous because you don't have that gift, and, and you wish you did. Or, or maybe it's an issue of pride. You're like, well, you know, my gift's better than yours, and, and I get recognized more in church, because, you know, some people, they're just on stage more, or they're more visible, or they're in front of the camera more, and so they get, uh, they get all the public accolades, and my, my gift is kind of buried in the bowels of the nursery, and no one ever sees that, and so maybe there's some, some pride or jealousy that can be attached to that, or even spiritual depression, 
or, or anxiety, because you don't, you don't know what your gift is, and you're, you want to know, and you want to serve, and you, you, maybe you don't know how, and so you're not serving, because you haven't, haven't discovered your spiritual gift yet. Well, all those things are really the wrong attitude and the wrong response we should have to the subject of spiritual gifts, and, and particularly the emphasis of what the Bible has when it talks about these things. And so I, I can't pretend to be able to answer all these questions tonight, but I do hope that correctly understanding spiritual gifts, at least in the broad framework, is what I wanna give you, will help us to understand them better, but will also help us and lead us to wanna care for one another better. The focus of our lesson tonight, our sermon tonight, is caring for one another with spiritual gifts. And I actually think when we have the right framework in place for understanding spiritual gifts, that is the natural way it'll flow. And so instead of being a source of division, it'll be a source of unity. Instead of being something that causes fights, it'll cause opportunities to serve one another and care for one another. So um, just to set the record straight though, before I I jump into the main point, I I do do wanna say that our church does teach and I do believe that there are some gifts, namely the miraculous gifts that are not operating today uh, as they did in the early church, and that's because there was a period in the foundation of the church where God was re- making new revelation, and Ephesians 2.20, for instance, says that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and so once the apostles were revealing that new revelation and laying that foundation down, there was no more need for fresh revelation because it's now been inscripturated for us. So we're not looking for a word from God outside of God's word, we look for it in God's word. And so that is what we believe as a church. If you wanna understand more about that, you can go on our church app and there's a whole midweek class on the Holy Spirit. We spend several hours talking about that if that's a source of confusion for you. We'd love for you to clear that up. But regardless of whether or not you agree with that or not, I think you can agree with what I'm trying to say tonight. And that is the bigger framework, whether these are gifts that are still in operation today or have already ceased, are still for the focus of building up the body of Christ, not tearing it apart. And so that's what I want to focus on. So what I want to give you tonight is uh, four ways that spiritual gifts help us to care for one another. Four ways that spiritual gifts help us to care for one another. Uh, Here's the first one, number one. Spiritual gifts demonstrate our unity as the body of Christ. In contrast to what I was just describing, tearing it apart, actually, number one, spiritual gifts demonstrate our unity as the body of Christ. So let's look back again at the verses we just read a few minutes ago in 1 Corinthians 12. Look at these first three verses. It says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. So So Paul's desire is that we understand how these work. And he says, you you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. So if someone's saying blasphemies, that's not by the power of the spirit. That's some other power, but it's not the spirit of God. But then he says, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. The only way that someone can profess Jesus is Lord, can make a profession that a Christian makes, is by the power of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that works in someone's heart that causes them to confess Christ. So that means that if you are a Christian, that means the Holy Spirit did that, and the Holy Spirit also empowers you. The Holy Spirit saves you, and he empowers you for service. And so we know the Spirit did that. No one is excluded. So if you're a Christian, everyone has the Spirit in them, and everyone has been empowered by the Spirit to serve the church. And he he goes on, look at the following verses. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So whether you have, so as we look in the church, we can look out and we can see, you know, lots of people have different gifts and they serve in different ways. 
and they have different empowerments from the Spirit. But behind them all is the same God. Did you notice the reference to the Trinity there? It's the same Spirit, the same Lord Jesus, and same God the Father. So behind them all is one God. It's one God that empowers them all. So there's one source of the power stemming from one God who empowers them. So even though there's a variety in the church of gifts of service, behind them all is one God. And not only is there one source for that empowerment, but there's one goal for those empowered serving gifts. Look at the very next verse. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For the common good. There, there's one purpose. So the way we say that here at First Baptist is that we wanna reach all of Jacksonville, of all of Jesus, for all of life. But we don't all do that in the same way. We're all contributing to the same mission, the same purpose, the same common good, but there's a variety of serving, variety of gifts, and a variety of spirit empowerments. But God is behind them all working. God sovereignly chose who to give what gifts, for what purpose, as he wills, but all directed in the same direction. So he, he gives some examples. So verse eight, for to the one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the, look what he says, he emphasizes this, same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit. So really, we talk about spiritual gifts, it's actually supposed to be emphasized in the unity of the body of Christ. And on top of all that, verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, whether it's a financial difference or a cultural difference or a language difference, all these different backgrounds, we all come to Christ and we're all made to drink of the one spirit. So when God the Holy Spirit saves you and baptizes you into the body of Christ, you're, the spirit places you into the body. That's what it means to be baptized by the spirit. Everyone experiences spirit baptism. And when you're saved, when you're baptized, and you become part of the body of Christ, you're not the only one there. Everyone else he saved is also there with all their different backgrounds, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, rich, poor, old, young, whatever language, you're all in the same, you all, the Spirit has done that for all of you and you all have the variety of gifts but for the same purpose. So really, the spiritual gifts are meant to demonstrate our unity as the body of Christ. So maybe a, an illustration. So think of like a, a sports team, right? Everyone comes together with different gifts and talents and abilities. If everyone tried to play the same position, it wouldn't work, but it works when they all come together for one purpose. You know, my, one of my favorite all-time sports movies, I got a lot of favorite sports movies, but one of my all-time favorite ones is the movie Miracle. Any, anyone seen that movie? Of course, of course, right? It's about the 1980 U.S. men's national hockey team and in 1980, it's the height of the Cold War, and the nemesis that we could never beat was Russia. At the time, the Russians used professional players, and they were well coached, and the U.S. team didn't use professional players then. They didn't use any NHL players. They just used college kids. And so we could never win. It was kind of embarrassing, but we really need to beat Russia. I mean, it was 1980. We had to beat them, and they're trying to come together. And there were some old rivalries between the players from college, and so they're getting in fights during practice. They weren't coming together. And there's the scene that anyone who's ever coached any peewee or little league, just, you know, that dad that just like tries to recreate this scene with every team, where they're fighting with each other, and he says, okay, you know, they're skating, run another lap, skate another lap. And so they're just doing these suicides, and they're just going on, like, do another lap, 
blow the whistle again, do another lap, do another lap. And they're going on and on and on, and they're, they're like exhausted, they're like throwing up, they're falling on the ground, the guy's closing the rink down, the medical doctor's trying to intervene, I think, I think we got a problem here. It's like, no, we're not done yet. And then all of a sudden, one player yells out, and instead of yelling out that he plays for his college team, you know, Boston or Minnesota, whatever, he says his name's like, I play for the United States of America. And the team comes together because they recognize they're coming together for one purpose, and they end up going ahead and winning, right? Of course, they're destined to win now. Had to be Russia. But, um, but the point is this. The reason it worked is not because they all did the same thing. Someone was a goalie, someone else was defense, someone else scored, someone else kept track of the, uh, the stats, someone else coached, but they all came together for one purpose. And that's what it's like here in our church. We don't all show up here on Sunday morning or during the week and all want to do the same job. If we all try to get up here and teach, no one would listen. If we all want to be out there serving, no one would be up here teaching. If everyone wanted to work all the media cameras, it would be a disaster, right? We, we have different gifts and skills, but we're all working towards the same purpose. And that's actually what shows our unity. So the spiritual gifts, even though there's a variety of gifts and abilities, because they come from the same source and they're directed in the same purpose, they actually show our unity as the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts show our unity as the body of Christ. Number two, spiritual gifts also direct us to serve each other in the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts direct us to serve one another in the body of Christ. Flip over to 1 Peter 4, one of the other key passages that talks about spiritual gifts. Here in 1 Peter 4, Peter writes this, he says in verse 10, as each has received a gift, so stop right there, that is a key verse to say that everyone, everyone has a spiritual gift. God's given every, maybe he's given you more than one, the Bible doesn't really specify, maybe they change over time, the Bible doesn't clarify that either, but everybody has a spiritual gift, so everyone has an obligation. So, verse 10, as each has received a gift, what are you supposed to do with it? Supposed to use it to serve God, right? We want to, Serve God with our spiritual gift. Well, that's not, that's not actually what it says. That's not really the focus, verse 10. It says, use it to serve one another. Your spiritual gift is designed to serve one another. The spiritual gifts direct us in our service to one another. And this emphasis of one anothering is in the passage. So go back to verse eight. Above all, Peter writes, keep loving one another. And then verse nine, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. What you do with love and with hospitality and serving is directed towards one another. And this fits with what the Bible teaches. Jesus says, if you, if, uh, he says to Peter, when he says, he questioned if he's restoring him after he denied him three times. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, you know I love you, Lord, and feed my sheep. Peter, I love you. Uh, Jesus, I love you. If you want to show him your love, take care of my lambs. And so, in the same way, if you want to know if you love God, you show that love by loving his people. In the same way, if you want to serve God, the way you serve him is by serving his people. You can't actually use your spiritual gift on your own. By the very nature of what they are and what purpose they serve, your spiritual gift is not meant to be used outside the church on your own to further your own ends and your own personal ministry. Your spiritual gift is actually directed to the body of Christ to serve the body of Christ. That's why you can't discover what your gift is or even rightly use your gift unless you're in the context of a local church. This is how your gift is supposed to be used. And this is the aim of the gift. But yet that ultimately serves an ultimate end. So he, he continues, verse 10, as good stewards of God's very grace, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So here he gives us two basic divisions. Gifts kind of fall in one of two categories, speaking gifts or serving gifts. But whether it's a speaking gift or serving gift, they're all directed to serve one another. But then he says, 
Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. So what he's saying is, by serving one another, that's how you serve God. By directing your serving energy towards your fellow member in the body of Christ, that's how actually you serve God. So this is so countercultural, right? Because we tend to think of when we have abilities or, or um, uh, gifts or talents, we, we use them to serve ourselves. And that's often what you see in the world, right? People have whatever talents and abilities they do and they use it to promote themselves or to see how great they are. Jesus warns that the Gentiles lord it over because they have power and they wield it against other people. And so we want to use our position or power or our spiritual gifts to serve each other. I thought of another reference. So, you know, um, Pastor Sean mentioned how all the kindergartners joined us this morning in the service. Well, we only have uh, childcare during the summers for zero to three. So we have the kids and all the teens for the summer. They take a break from kids' work and student worship in the auditorium with us on Sunday nights. So I, th I thought of an illustration to try to connect with you guys. My kids will tell me later it was a bad illustration, but that's okay. So my favorite superhero is Batman, but my second favorite superhero is Spider-Man. Right, and the most critical moment for Spider-Man to actually become a superhero is, right, when he first gets his powers and abilities, and he's got super strength, and he's using it, what does he do? His first inclination wasn't to help other people. He's like, oh, I gotta earn a few bucks. He goes down to the underground wrestling ring, and he starts beating up some guys, and he's getting money, right? Because he's using his powers and abilities, but he's using them, but he's not, just because he has them, he's using them to serve himself. And you know the story, Right, uh, the, uh, the guy steals some money and he doesn't use his powers to stop the guy because it doesn't bother him, and that guy goes and kills his Uncle Ben. And then it, in recollection of this event, he remembers the famous saying from every Spider movie, and now the new one's trying to butcher it, right? With great power comes great responsibility. But what he has to do with that responsibility is not to serve himself, but to serve others. In the same way, in a similar way, God has given you your own spiritual empowerment. That's the word used in 1 Corinthians 12. He's given you a spiritual gift, a gift of grace that you wouldn't have otherwise that the Spirit gave you. And that gift that he's given you, you shouldn't use to serve yourself. It's aimed at and directed to serve one another. So, as you think about what the Lord's given you interest for and given you talents for and abilities for. You should be thinking not just how I can make more money or how I can promote myself on social media or whatever. You should be thinking about who in the body of Christ could benefit from this and use it to serve each other. Lots of examples for how to do that. But the main thing is aiming it towards the church. Thirdly, spiritual gifts develop humility in the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts actually should develop humility in the body of Christ. That some people take pride in their spiritual gift is antithetical to the design of the scriptures for your spiritual gift. They should develop humility in the body of Christ. So flip back to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, at the end of verse 11, he says that the same spirit apportions to each one individually as he wills. What that says here, remember, God the Holy Spirit is a person. The mind and intellect, emotions, just like God the Son, God the Father. And God the Holy Spirit, according to his will, he decided which gift you get and which gift you don't get. He decided that. There's nothing you did to warrant the gift you've been given or to earn it or to show your superiority because you have this gift over someone else's gift. In fact, God the Holy Spirit decided which gift you're gonna have. Right there, that, that there's undercuts the pride we wanna take as though we achieve something. The Holy Spirit gave you that gift. And then he goes on, look at verse 14 and following. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, 
That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them, as he chose. God chose some of you to be ears, some of you to be feet, some of you to be heads, some of you to be noses, some of you to be eyeballs. God chose that. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. God decided what role you would play in the body of Christ. And he gave you a gift to correspond with the role he gave you. And so, that should promote humility because you're just recognizing that God's just doing what God's doing. And therefore, you're not jealous because you can't do what someone else does. Or you're not prideful in thinking that you're better than someone else because you have this gift. Well, God decided you'd have that one, God decided them to have that gift. So you don't have a reason to boast because it's God who gave you that gift. And that gift is to serve one another. And so you need each other. It, the, the picture here is a picture of like, you know, uh, a, a, a head and arms with no feet, just crawling with your hands. You need your feet. Or, or uh, a nose with no eyes. It, it can smell, but it bumps into things. It's got no eyes. It, it's it's a, meant to be a humorous picture because it's just ridiculous. Of course you need all the parts of your body to function rightly and properly. In the same way, you need your fellow brothers and sisters in this room and their special gifts, their spiritual gifts that God gave them to round you out. Because <laughs> you can't do it all yourself. Some of you try to do more than you should do because you're not just focusing on your gift. Some of you are trying to serve in a way that you're not qualified to serve in. There's a reason why Pastor Scott has to have some auditions for people when they serve in the choir. Not everybody, he doesn't want me to serve in the choir. That's not my spiritual gift. You're all like, yeah, yeah, we don't want you in the choir. And maybe on, maybe on Mother's Day. On Mother's Day, on Mother's Day, he'll let us serve there. So the, the, the point is, we have different gifts and we serve in different ways. So uh, let me show you another passage on this before we go to the last point. Go to Romans 12, another key passage on spiritual gifts. At this point, you get a, a sense of this. Another passage to help promote humility, Romans chapter 12, verse three, says, for the, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Some of you don't think of sober judgment. Some of you think you're better than you are. So just have a reasonable accounting of what you can do and what you can't do, and figure that out. And then, He's talking about spiritual gifts, because he says, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. He doesn't, mean, he doesn't mean like believing faith, he means the grace gift. He's talking about spiritual gifts. Look what he says, verse four. For as in one, member, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So he's saying you have different gifts because God's given you different grace, so use it accordingly. Here's his example. If prophecy, then use it in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Whatever your gift is, lean into that. That's how you discover what your spiritual gift is. You serve the body in the context of the church and you just figure out what's working and what's not working. And if you're not good at something, you don't focus on that. You focus on what you're good at and you lean into that. So if you're a good leader, then do it of zeal. If you're one who contributes, do it of generosity. If you do acts of mercy, do it of cheerfulness, not bitterness that you're the one doing that. That's a gift God gave you. We, we can't all do it all. I mean, unless you're Pastor Trevor. You know, Pastor Heath said this morning that Pastor Trevor is the most widely gifted person we have. You remember a couple weeks ago, he literally, on, on Mother's Day, he was, he was singing up here in the choir, then he came down here preaching, and he's working the puppet, he does, he does the dad band on Wednesday nights. 
Well, okay, even if you have that many gifts, I know Pastor Trevor wouldn't say he has every gift. But the point is, these are just illustrations of lots of different ways you can serve. You know, in my grow group, we were talking about serving a year and a half ago. And um, one of the guys was like, yeah, I'm kind of looking for a way to maybe to get more involved in the church and serve. And then on Sunday morning, we flashed a slide of our James 1 ministry. James 1 uh, it says, um, true religion cares for widows and orphans. So we have a ministry we call James 1. It's a group of guys in our church that are handy, and they serve our widows. The example we had that one Sunday morning is they built a ramp. They needed handicapped access. She was in a wheelchair. So we built a ramp so they could get in. Well, I think that's amazing. I, I don't serve in the James 1 ministry. They told me I'm not allowed. Now, I could go and I could hold the nail while someone else hits it. But I, I, I'm just not handy like that. I, I wish I was more, but that's just not my gifts and ability. And if I spent more time and energy trying to develop that gift, which I'm not very good at anyway, then I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right now. But some of you, you're not called to be a Sunday school teacher, and it wouldn't go real well, but you're gifted in other ways. Yeah, I mean, some of you, I mean, this is not listed as a spiritual gift, but changing diapers, that should be a spiritual gift. I mean, I, the only, I think, maybe there's one exception, but I think the only diapers I ever changed were my own kids. And even then, I wasn't very good at it. My wife came by later, why are the kids still crying? And oh, they got diaper rash, and I'm trying to put this cream on there and powder, and it was a big old mess, and I was just, I probably need to get a little better at it. But the point is, some of you love babies, and you love serving in that way. Well, my by my goodness, that helps our church, that serves our young parents and allows people to be in here to hear the word taught. And that's a, that's a way to serve. Some of you love passing out food on Wednesday nights, and that's a way to serve. Some of you love coming here during the week when no one else is here and counting money, or helping with media, or some of you transcribe messages or input data because that's a way you can serve. There's so many different ways to serve. And all these different ways represent what your interests are and your abilities and your gifts and your willingness to just give what God has given you to serve the body. So find out what you like to do and what you're good at and lean into that and focus on that. And whatever that gift is, God will honor that. God will use that for his glory and to serve his body. All right, lastly, lastly, spiritual gifts destroy without love in the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts destroy without love in the body of Christ. Flip back, 1 Corinthians. So here we have, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, three whole chapters on spiritual gifts. I mean, at a 16-chapter book, that's a lot of material on one subject. And right in the middle of these three chapters is chapter 13, the, the love chapter. A lot of times we you know, read these verses at weddings, or maybe at a Valentine's Day or something like that, and that's not inappropriate. They're helpful descriptions of what love is. But in the context, he gives this instruction and in reference to spiritual gifts. And I think the point is, as I said, spiritual gifts destroy without love in the body of Christ. So look at this briefly with me as we close. Verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verse one. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, if such a thing existed, but have not love, it doesn't sound good. People don't want to hear what I'm saying. In fact, without love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's just an annoying sound that nobody wants to listen to. Or verse two, if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all the faith is to move mountains, but I don't have love, then I have nothing, I have nothing. Verse three, if I give away all I have and, I and if I deliver up my body to be burned, the ultimate sacrifice, but have not love, I gain nothing. You could sacrifice everything you have, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. Instead of building up the body, you're actually tearing it down, tearing it down. And the same goes of spiritual gifts. Look at verse eight. The reason love is better is because love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. All these spiritual gifts will come to their fulfillment when Christ returns. We won't need them anymore. 
But love will abide. Love will continue. It makes it the same point one more time at the end of the chapter, verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. One day faith will turn to sight when Jesus returns. One day hope will find its fulfillment when Jesus is here. We're no longer waiting for him. He's here now. But even when faith is realized and hope is fulfilled, all that happens, we still have love because love will continue. Love existed before the creation among the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and love will exist forever in eternity future as well. So without love, all of our efforts to serve one another and use our spiritual gifts will be meaningless. In fact, it will undermine what we're trying to do. The old adage is true. They don't care how much you know, or if I'm gonna paraphrase, they don't care how great or amazing your spiritual gift is or how amazing your talent is or how gifted you are unless they first know that you love them. Christ says to show your love for him by loving one another. And you can do that with your spiritual gift. And if you understand these four things in reference to spiritual gifts, then it will promote unity, it will prefer, pr- promote serving one another, it will promote um, love in the body of Christ as you seek to direct your gifts and service to each other. So don't get all hung up tonight on speaking tongues or prophesying or miracles. The focus of the gifts that you have right now are to serve one another and therefore serve God and to do it with love. And if you can do that humbly, then God will use that for his glory and then we'll show genuine care for one another and we'll be people of compassion in a world of hate. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that your word just brings clarity and instruction to us in a topic that's often fraught with division and arguments. I pray that we can walk away from tonight and understanding a little better how spiritual gifts work so that we love and serve you by serving each other. I pray, God, that you would promote a real unity in our church, that we would be people of compassion, first and foremost because we love you, but therefore we would show it by loving each other. I thank you, Father, for your word and the help it gives us on even difficult topics like this. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.